Hi, my name is Millie. I'm autistic and uh, ADHD, and I make videos about uh, autism and neurodiversity. And I'm here with my mom. I'm gonna interview. So um, yeah, I've never really done any interviews before. So thanks for doing this. Appreciate it. I have questions actually from, um, I got a link to this organization StoryCorps, and they have these really great questions to ask people that you're close to. So I thought I'd just go through some of the questions and thanks for agreeing to answer them. Yeah, this is my mom, Petra, but I don't call her mom, I call her Petra. That's a story for maybe another question. I never called my parents mom and dad, but that's from before I remember. So anyways, I'm just gonna try and find some questions. So who has been the biggest influence in your life? And oh yeah, I'll just start with that. Who has been the biggest influence in your life? The, the biggest influence, it really depends what what area of, of my life. I mean, they're, they're yeah, different parts of my life. I, I would say my children, having children, are, it's been the biggest influence for me, the biggest joy, the greatest joy, some are also some of the greatest pain, and has really influenced who I am and what I do. But if you are looking for sort of people around family, um, from when I was younger, when I was in school, um, I had a teacher. She was very young, starting to teach, and I was in high school, and it was a new model of high school that encouraged working class kids to get to post-secondary education. I come from a working class background. I would ordinarily probably not have gone to university, but the school system allowed me to move forward. And, and with being a, a very forward thinking system, our teachers were sort of more on the left leaning, maybe you could even radical <laughs> side. And, and I had this um, just amazing teacher. I had her in English and German literature and um, uh, she she opened my eyes to the world and she taught all of us and critical thinking and and I really appreciated that in her that she never even when you look at a piece of literature even if you look at Shakespeare she had well, what does what did that mean in the context of the time what does it tell us today why do we still read it um, she had us read literature from Ireland um, uh, from the, about the Irish famine and we discussed the IRA and the history of the IRA and all that and she got into a bit of trouble of that eventually mm -hmm. and that's when we switched to Shakespeare but her name is Uli Gauklitz and um, I as a teacher um, she was a was a huge influence and then um, jumping fast forward what is a big part of my, my life now is um, drug policy advocacy, changing our flawed drug policies, which I started doing after your little brother, after your little brother Danny died from mm. um, uh, fentanyl poisoning in 2014. And the person who influenced me the most in that regard is an Edmonton nurse called Marlis Taylor. Mm. Mm -hmm. She works um, in harm reduction programs in Edmonton. She started the first SCS. She was the first to distribute naloxone. And again, Marlis is somebody who who taught me how to think about things critically and to to analyze and and always put the person first. Always, she's um, uncompromising and always putting the person first. And and if I have complicated questions, Marlis is somebody I'd like to turn to. Yeah, that's so cool. Nurses are amazing. Yeah, that uh, that story about your teacher. What what grade was that? That was in high school. She was school. my teacher from um, uh, grade ten to grade thirteen, and uh, I went to high school in Germany. And there, there are thirteen grades, and the three grades of high school. And I still um, I saw her a few years back. We had high school anniversary. Um, and uh, I can't oh, yeah. even remember which one, but I saw her back then and uh, she she ended up going, living abroad, doing different things. She's still a very interesting person to talk to. That's cool, you're still connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember the last time I've seen one of my teachers, but yeah, yeah that'd be interesting. Can you talk a bit about trying to remember how like the high school is so different, right? In terms of the, there's like the different tracks. So like what kind of, school were you in with the in Germany? Well, in, in Germany, there, there are th 
three separate streams for schools for kids who'd graduated grade nine and you, you don't have all get a high school diploma you can go with a more basic degree in grade nine or basic finish in grade nine or or most people go on to grade 10 and then they go on to learn a trade and go would go to a technical college for a day or two a week while learning a trade um, so that's what most students would do and you decide in grade five if you go to what's called a gymnasium strange word maybe in english but it's like um um yeah like e levels in britain maybe mm. um, oh, yeah. and so you decide in grade five if you send your kid to a school that will give them the degree they can go to university with or the, the finish they can go to university with or if you send your kid to the school where they can go into a trade stream and there are opportunities to cross over later in life, but they are more difficult. And the school I went to, instead of sending the kids off in this different direction, which is a very classist kind of system, because mm. the wealthier you are, the more support you have at home, the more likely you're going into the stream that sends you to high school and to university. Um, so I went to a school which was called um, a Gesamtschule, a, a, a collective school, where all the kids were in the same class and um, they tried to um, encourage more kids to go into the stream that would eventually lead you to high school. Mm -hmm. So you had until grade nine really to get the grades that were good enough so you could go on for those last three years. So working class kids like me could finish grade 13 and eventually go on to university, which, which I did. Oh yeah. So that, that teacher really, like that all puts you really on a track, right? So like, I mean, it sounds like that teacher, can you talk about a bit about how it influenced your, um, I don't know, like I, I have this view of you being kind of like, you know, like always been fighting for justice and mm -hmm. doing activism and protesting and that kind of stuff. Um, and can you talk about how that influenced you, like coming out of school around that age? Um, certainly uh, in our school, as I said, it was kind of a left leaning school and not only this teacher, but other teachers as well. We talked about social justice. Social justice was a big issue in, in, in any any subject we, we talked about. We always analyzed why is it this way? What would need to be for it to be different? And then there were other students with similar way of thinking. And I remember, for example, um, uh, the year um, that uh, Salvador Allende was was overthrown, I was still mm. still a school kid, and I went to a huge protest in Frankfurt, and and how distraught and disappointed we were all are, and we we had to express this. So, yeah, my my kind of social justice interest started very early, but maybe it even it started in my cradle with my mom in a way I think because. I was born um, uh, to a single mom, which in 1958 was a big deal. Mm. Um, mm. It was yeah out of wedlock, mm. one said in those days in English. Scandalous. Yeah, it was scandalous and such. And so my mom always told me um, that don't take don't take any uh, yeah take anything from every anybody. You are as good as anybody else. Don't let people tell you that you're not as good as other people. Stand oh, okay. up for yourself. So she always told me to stand up for yourself and mm. um, that I'm I'm just as good as anybody else, even mm. if I don't have a dad. I had a stepdad later then, um, but and then I was short. I, I still am short. Mm -hmm. like I was short and tiny. I'm not mm -hmm. so tiny anymore. Um, and she told me, you know, it doesn't matter how tall you are. You know, you are a big person. You don't mm -hmm. have to be happy. So my mom encouraged me to stand up for myself. And, and that is something that I took through school and, and the school system that I was in really encouraged um, thinking, critical thinking, um, analysis and, and acting when you see injustice in the world. And um, yeah, that's... That's what I was have been doing all my life professionally. Um, I worked I, in the disability field. I worked frontline. I yeah. I did consulting. I taught at a at a university. 
Um, so a lot of my activism were, were around dis disability and the environment and those kind of things and, until Danny died and, and mm -hmm. my energy and, and the skills that I took from these other movements really went into the drug policy world. Yeah, yeah, kind of the perfect combination of skills for this, like how it all came together. What is your earliest memory of anything? You know, it, it is really hard to say what is an early memory yeah. and what do you remember because um, your parents told it over and over. Yeah. So so some things I consider early memories are maybe my mom's favorite stories and mm. and one story that she likes to tell and I sort of, have, I think I have memories of, I can picture myself. Um, after we bought a house in the town when I grew up, we had to take a, a long bus ride from the town we were living to the town where that house was, was being built. And um, my mom said, I always, I, I carried a teddy bear with me and I talked mm. to people on the bus, including the bus driver, mm -hmm. and I would tell them um, adventures, um, my, what my teddy bear had done and what my teddy bear mm. um, was going to do. Basically, I was sharing what I was going to do, but I put it in the third person, oh, yeah. the teddy bear. So that is kind of a story I like. Uh, um, another one I like is that my mom and dad worked shift. Mm -hmm. And when I was really little, they would um, take me along, like my mom and stepdad, I, she married when I was, I think, four, three or four. Um, and they would take me along on a bicycle, in the back seat of a bicycle, um, and leave me with um, the security guard at the entrance to the factory. I mean, imagine that today, it's impossible. But they'd, yeah. the, whoever went into the factory, because, um, it ended at two or three, it ended and started at the same time. So there was a 10 minute gap with a person having to go in and a person coming out. So they'd leave me with a security guard and I'd be sitting with a security guard and, and there was a, a lever they pushed um, and it was randomized. If it turned red, you have to, the workers had to open up their bag to show that they hadn't stolen anything. Mm -hmm. And the security guard would let me pull, push, pull the lever um, and then mm. when if my mom went in and my dad came out 10 minutes later, they'd, they'd take me home. And I, I sort of, I think I have a glimpse of memory of that. And another fun memory when I was little was that I always wanted a little brother. I, I never had mm. siblings. Um, I learned later through an uncle airing during the laundry that, that my mom at some point had an abortion after I was born and that might have been related to the fact that she couldn't have um, uh, children anymore. But I really, I, mm. she had, she had t told me, I thought babies come from the stork. That's what we were told those days. And she oh, had the told me literal stork story, the, the little literal stork mm. story. And if you want the stork to come, you have to give the stork flour and sugar. And one of those times I know I was home alone between shift changes. Um, my mom had bought, um, sugar and flour for Christmas baking and you can imagine where that goes, right? <laughs> I took I took all the flour. I thought, you know, we're gonna do this right now. Yeah. This stork wants sugar and flour and we're gonna give it to him. Oh yeah. Okay. So so I dumped um a, a huge amount of sugar and flour, probably most of what she needed for her Christmas baking on the windowsill. <laughs> that was fun. That's yeah, oh my gosh. I really feel that that like very literal taking stories very literally. Is that stork story? Is that, that it seems, I wouldn't be surprised, is that like a Ger German folklore kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. Or at I least mean, European folklore? You see these children's books where, you know, there is a baby in a sling and the stork is flying. Like when yeah, you buy, yeah, when I know you that buy, imagery, yeah. yeah, when you buy, like even today, when you buy greeting cards, when somebody had a baby, you see mm -hmm. the stork yeah, flying yeah. and the baby hanging in the sling. Yeah. yeah, we get so much of our mm. pop, you know, popular culture stories from yeah. those things. Yeah, mm. I was like, I was think of early memories being related to, yeah, like the way you said about them being kind of you don't know sometimes if your own memories or if it's mm. somebody's story. Mm -hmm. But I think of it too sometimes like I was appreciated that you, uh, you took so many photos, right? Mm -hmm. We both yeah. did, and then, yeah. and then I feel like that about my memories are like what of them are some 
photos, you know, mm -hmm. or not? Yeah. Or like, do I really remember myself? But like, yeah. did you, did you have much photos from when you were that like really young? I, have, like, I don't think I've seen... I have one album. Yeah. One, yeah. Of, I've seen one a few, album but... that, that is half full that probably spans all my childhood. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Until I <laughs> got my own camera as a teenager. Yeah. Yeah, I was appreciated that you took mm -hmm. so many photos. Like, mm -hmm. I'm just a whole history of myself yeah. and everything. What is your favorite memory of me? <laughs> if my favorite memory of you. Um, could be any time, I guess. Yeah, uh, I mean, of course, there there are memories throughout the lifespan. You know, when you were slow to walk, and mm. you you had this army crawl, and which I later learned, you know, like it also is related to neurotypical kids kind of having more delayed motor development and such, and and often being late to walk and such. But you're very late to walk. But when you finally did, you sort of ran, but you had kind of a funny run your legs were high and and i have and, and again it relates to a photo we also have you have this white snowsuit where you're running with you wearing your white oh. snowsuit yes see i know that yeah. you see that photo and i know yeah. that exact photo yeah. so hmm. and then um what always meant a lot to me that you were out of you and your siblings the only one who had an interest in horses Mm. So seeing you on my horse and riding is a is a is a favorite memory. Mm. And then of course when we did biathlon together, biathlon mm. was a ton of fun and I remember how proud I was of you when you shot clean for mm. the first time. And yeah, that was so much fun to go on these biathlon races together and then and then mm. um it's not so much a ha happy memory but a memory that just amazed me when um, when you had your surgery mm -hmm. to transition mm -hmm. and how you went into this, how you lived through it, how you came mm -hmm. out of it. You were so incredibly strong and tough and and I was dissolving and I thought, wow. And mm -hmm. I knew that was something that you really wanted, but but it took it took so much strength. I was very proud of you, how much strength you showed and, and determination. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that was, I don't know, I think sometimes it was like, yeah, I mean, it was horrible and uncomfortable and painful, but mm -hmm. but worth it. But um, but yeah, I think it was definitely some parts of that were harder on you than they were on mm -hmm. me, for sure. Yeah, yeah, it was a tough time. Mm -hmm. but. I don't know. I think I just go into those things too easily sometimes. I just like I'm just like fine say, saying yes, and then I yeah. don't know. Then then the reality of it is yeah. harder than I imagine. Where I anticipate, I anticipate all the problems before, and then oh yes, I anticipated this, and this problem really happened. <laughs> um. Yeah. So I wanted to ask about um, yeah, because because me figuring out so I was diagnosed as an adult with autism and ADHD, but it's, you kind of put me on that path a little bit, or like, uh, like, can you tell me about, about that story? Like, uh, like to me, I feel like you were the kind of trigger of just officially looking into things. Like, do you remember that? I don't remember exactly which incident you're referring to. Oh, okay. To. It was because I was having issues with work, like after leaving a job and then, oh, yeah. You know, and I think just like the uh, kind of things I had going on with work, and then yeah, well, I was I was kind of looking at things, and and I saw patterns emerge. Mm -hmm. You know, where things you got, would go into something, and it was really great and great for a while, and then mm -hmm. um, difficulties would arise, and those difficulties were often related to interpersonal relations with people in the office. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, and and not letting things go. I mean, your steel detailing job, I think you really lost over a plant. Um, yeah. Because, you know, how when they brought the plant into the office and decided the girls of the office would look after the plant mm -hmm. and told you to water the plant and you wanted mm -hmm. a watering can and the manager said he'd get a watering can. Yeah. And then you really became so focused on the fact that he never remembered to buy a watering can that the watering can became a f power struggle 
and really yeah. for them probably a symbol of the difficulties that I mean, you were you were good at that job you were good at that job probably your challenge with that job was that um, uh, often when people do work they compromise on things and you you yeah. with your autism you pretty much buy the book yeah um, they wanted me to compromise more than I was willing to I mean, yeah sometimes it was too slow on certain things but yeah. Well, mostly I was good at it, but yeah, yeah, so, yeah, you're right. The interpersonal stuff, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I saw I saw patterns emerge and and just kind of said you should. I I wasn't immediately thinking of, of being neurotypical and autism, um, but although I always thought that members of our family are maybe somewhat of on the spectrum, just kind of with sensory issues. Mm -hmm. All of us, um, all of us have sensory issues and. And we are not such a huggable family. Danny was probably the most huggable of anyone. I really family. like hugs, but yeah, we all do kind of mm. light hugs, and I like yeah. tight, tight hugs. Yeah, yeah, mm. um, yeah, yeah. I do notice that in all of us mm. for sure. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I appreciated that. I mean, I appreciated that you kind of brought me up. It just clicked. Like, there's always those things that, like, on some level, you're kind of thinking about it. You notice all mm. these things, but yeah. then it takes somebody externally to like say something and they're like, oh yeah. yeah, maybe I should look into this. But take somebody you like, you know, and trust to yeah. like, say something like that to take it more seriously. Yeah. Well, as I learned about it and also looking back at you as a childhood, you know, there's stuff that be, I, uh, a lot of um, uh, autistic uh, people or kids, infants have difficulty with, uh, have a lot of gastrointestinal issues. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those days say, oh, it's a colicky child, it's a colicky child, but you were an extremely colicky child. Mm -hmm. You'd feed and you'd cry and cry and cry. And there was, it mm -hmm. was so hard and so stressful as well to settle you down. and. And, and I remember that, and you also had um, sort of you, separation anxiety. You couldn't leave the room. To you, it was almost like when the person left the room, they were gone. So as always, we lived in this little farmhouse, and we had to, I had to go get wood to make a fire. Oh, and yeah. I was still in Germany, and, and move around. She had to move around rooms, separate rooms, and keep fires going and things, and go out and feed the horses and the sheep. and. I always, I had you sitting on my hip. I dragged you along everywhere. And <laughs> I was still very skinny back then. I was very skinny after you were born. Mm -hmm. um, and and you were not a big, small baby. So it's just, <laughs> the neighbors always shook their head. Here she is. And they said, why can't you just leave that kid in the house? You know, put him in a playpen for five minutes. Won't kill him. Yeah, yeah. But you just screamed at the top of your lungs. and. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah, that would have been hard to deal with. Mm -hmm. I'd have a hard time. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, if you don't, you can't communicate what to do. And okay. I think now, I mean, I like still have a lot of separation anxiety mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 Do you remember what was going through your head when you first saw me? Well, that is a whole story to itself because mm -hmm. you were nine days old when I first saw you. Yeah, that's the thing, right? That's yeah, not the usual. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I had a really difficult delivery. You had a difficult birth. Uh, mm -hmm. You were rushed off to a, um, a children's hospital, which was different from the hospital where I was in. And you were in the ICU for nine days. And actually, the first time I saw you was on a photo. Um, oh. your, your dad and pre-digital camera your dad went to a photo shop and um, so she's shoot the photo go get it developed no mm. no he went oh. to a, a shop and he wanted to buy a Polaroid camera oh, but it was okay. more expensive and <laughs> he told the owner of the shop um, that um, uh, you know the, he, what he wanted to buy it for that he wanted to take a picture of the infant son because there was no development took two weeks no matter what development no, was, there no one hour photo, there was no, one hour photo. <laughs> no, there was no one hour photo so he explained to the man that he wanted to take a photo of his infant child and and show it to the mom who hadn't seen the child yet um, like when I woke up after you, I, I had a C-section when I woke up and mm -hmm. and I looked around, I said to the nurse, I want, I want to see my, my baby. And mm -hmm. the nurse said, 
your baby's okay and I said well that's great uh, can I see the baby and, and she said no um, the baby's at the children's hospital and, mm -hmm. I, and I was really still fuzzy from the painkiller and the surgery and I said to the nurse that doesn't make sense to me if the baby is okay why is mm. the baby not here and she said mm. well the baby is, is okay considering the circumstance and mm. so then yeah i really wanted to meet you so what what rick did what your dad did he went to this camera shop told him the story and the man in the end but then said but i'm sorry i can't i can't afford that i i'm i'm a young father don't, don't have that kind of extra money mm. and the yeah. shop owner lent him the camera <laughs> the display model so, That's really cool. So he, I didn't know that. And we have those pictures in your photo album. You have spaghetti coming from your oh, hand because yeah. they were mm -hmm. checking your brain activity mm -hmm. um, and also heart rate and stuff. So, um, yeah, so Rick took that picture and, and that's the first time I thought, I said, oh, I was so, I was, I was very moved because I didn't believe, is there a baby? Are they keeping something from me? You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's, really happy that there was a baby and then then when I saw you for the first time um I I thought oh my god this is so beautiful and, mm -hmm. and I, you, when you see your child for the first time you feel love it's different love than you would feel for a partner mm -hmm. um makes sense and and you, you're overwhelmed with that love but also because of your medical history I was kind of scared and saying oh my god this is all my responsibility I have to keep this this little thing healthy and well and make sure it grows up well and is happy and and all the things so so i was also i was overwhelmed with the magnitude of it because i had never had siblings and i didn't know what it was like to be around little people that you look after so mm -hmm. and after we took you home from hospital i would i remember uh you know they, they told me in the hospital to, to let them know if you do anything unusual well, to me, as a new mom, would never babysat or yeah. uh, never changed a diaper before. And everything was unusual, so that was a bit unnerving. Yeah, yeah, as a first for any parent, yeah, it'd mm. be like everything scary would be yeah. scary. Yeah, but but I mean, a lot of people, you know, they've been around siblings and such. Yeah, and, and you know, maybe with a larger family. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think about that too because our family's not so small, and I moved away and stuff too, mm. so. I haven't had that experience of having yeah. love like nieces and nephews and stuff to be around really yeah. at all. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, it's too bad to miss out on that, that experience, but yeah. Yeah, the first newborn I saw was not your brother Julian because I also, with that C-section, they were trying to give me an epidural where you stay awake, but mm -hmm. it was an emergency again. Julian decided to arrive before he was scheduled. Mm -hmm. So again, I didn't meet him. The first newborn I met was Danny. Yeah. And he looked like a little Buddha when they called <laughs> him up and showed him to me. Yeah. 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 No. I remember Danny well, well when he was born. Yeah. Hmm. That's nice that, um, yeah, I love that story about the camera shop too. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. Yeah. It was very know. touching. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was nice that he went and did the, mm -hmm. got in the camera too. Yeah. Okay. Should we leave it at that? Yeah. Yeah. It's a good one to finish up on. Mm -hmm. Hello, this is Millie from Later. Link tell by my purple hair. Um, I'm just doing the editing and I realized I was going to, I think I'd found those interview questions and we were doing the interview and I had planned on continuing the interview later with more questions. Uh, we just ran out of time that morning and uh, yeah, but it was a good in good interview, and I just wanted to add this in because I didn't uh, get to say thank you to my mom at the end. So thank you, Petra, for doing the interview. Um, yeah, it worked out really nicely. I just wanted to say thanks as well to everybody for watching, and uh, you can check out my other channels for more content about neurodiversity and autism. And um, thanks also to everybody who uh, supports me financially to be able to make these videos and if you'd like to do that I'll have a link in the description as well as well as some links to um, some of the topics mentioned in this video including the uh, the story cars questions that I that were the inspiration for doing this interview and uh, some of the questions for the ones 
I use directly. They're really, really great, um, great and interesting interview questions. Okay, thanks for watching. Bye.